Hi, how are you guys doing today? Great. Yeah. You're here to learn about rail security. Yeah. yeah. How many people are absolutely certain their Rails application is 100% secure? <laughs> yes. Rich, I believe. Anybody else, maybe not. Uh, this is us. We got a great introduction, so we'll just skip that. I started thinking about security seriously uh, this past fall when I ran into this article by uh, Patrick McKenzie, and he is writing. That uh, the uh, Diaspora uh, code base, which is a Facebook open source Facebook replacement that respects your privacy, that code just went out on alpha release, and he was interested in it, so he he checked it out and thought he would look it over, and he was surprised to find several uh, he says numerous severe security errors, and then in summary he says the bottom line is. Currently, there is nothing that you cannot do to someone's Diaspora account. Absolutely nothing. In other words, the site is entirely hackable. You can take over anybody's account quite easily. I don't know, but that scared me. <laughs> because I'm thinking, I said, well, I do Rails development. And you know what? I know the basics of security. I've gone through all the security lessons, and I know all that stuff. And it was scary to me. It, it bothered me a lot. Um, let me just give you a for instance here. This is some uh, code that we were playing around with back at Edge Case. We did the Ruby Cohen's, and someone had the great idea of let's put the Cohen's online so you can actually go through the Cohen's on a web page. And you can go here, and you can see these are tests. We are asserting equal. You can fill these things out, and when you fill them out with the right thing, the test turns green. Well, we're actually typing in Ruby code at that point and evaluating it in the, in the browser. Yeah, you're laughing already. You know what's coming, right? <laughs> within two minutes of the guy who did this, he published it in our campfire room. Within two minutes of that, someone did this. <laughs> <laughs> the answers which you seek are, and this is the Etsy password file. What he did, he typed in system cap Etsy password. Uh, into the uh, text box there. Well, he thought, ha ha, that's clever. I'll fix you guys. I'll just disable the system command. So we switched to using back kicks. <laughs> okay, okay, smart guys. We'll just disable back kicks. <laughs> At this point, he decided, all right, I need a real. Um, Sandbox to put this stuff in and, and actually we're working on putting this online for real right now and it's in a real sandbox Theoretically, you're not going to be able to uh, break into it once we actually release it But we're still we're still playing around with these these ideas, but the question is I, You know we were playing around with this and we knew it wasn't secure It was an internal thing and we were just having fun with it, but in real life What are the security concerns in real life? just two maybe three days ago I saw this post from Martin Fowler. Anybody see this one? This is on ThoughtWorks.com. And if these guys don't know what they're doing, what hope is there for the rest of us? <laughs> Evidently, they have some malware on their website. It's, it's transient. They can't track it down. It shows up sometimes in their Google reports, sometimes not. They're not quite sure where it is. Uh, it might even be a problem with our passion. We don't know for sure. They are tracking this down. Now, they have suspicions, and they think they've tracked it down, and they're working at it. And if you see anything suspicious, let them know. But this is a tough problem to solve, absolutely. We have, we've used five minutes now of our 30-minute talk. We are not going to be able to cover anywhere near all the security concerns that uh, you have to think about when you're doing a website uh, in the next 30 minutes. Absolutely no way. And I want to say, first of all, I am not a security expert. I did not study these things in depth. These are just things I got interested in when I saw that, um, that posting. So I want to thought it would be a good idea to share with you some of the basics. These are the basics that you should be doing. First of all, you have a reading assignment. After you hear this talk, Every one of you should go and read the Rails Security Guide. This is really comprehensive and really good. And they cover things specifically with Rails. Another thing is the, you can Google for this. Uh, 
guides Ruby on Rails.org, security.html. That's easy to find. The other one is the OWASP Ruby on Rails security write-up. Uh, this is a PDF. This is a hunking 48 pages of stuff that you need to know if you're doing a public website. And I'll say public website, if you're doing an internal website, there's vulnerabilities in those as well, too. And this is a good guide to point that out. So that's your reading assignment after you get done here. But now for the fun. This is your typical setup for a Rails application. You got your server, you got your browser, you got your database. Out of these components, which of them do you trust? The arrows. <laughs> the arrows. <laughs> well, obviously not the browser. That is totally out of your control uh, completely. So anything coming in from the browser is suspect. You need to validate it, you need to check it for bad things, and you need to treat that data with the utmost respect. That includes not only data and forms, but also cookie values and URLs. Do not put critical data in URLs because they can be easily hacked. All of this stuff can be easily hacked. We're going to demo that today for you. What else shouldn't you trust? Well, the database. You may think you have complete control of that database, but it is quite easy for a hacker to slip in data past your application. And just because it's in a database you control doesn't mean that it's good data and it's safe to display however you want to. Um, Cross-site scripting attacks often come from storing stuff in the database that is later displayed to other users. So out of all these things, maybe you can trust the Rails server because that's where your code is running. If you can't trust your code, uh, you've probably got bigger security issues than we want to talk about right here. But in particular, browser and database are the things you need to be concerned with. <laughs> so we're going to start with the basic um, vulnerability. I call this the Little Bobby Tables vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> and we have in our application, we picked an application that Matt and Jerry at Edgecase did. It's a very nice movie night reservation type thing. You want to watch a movie, you send invites to some friends and tell them what movies you're going to watch. We played around with this application and we have, we have um, let me preface this, all the vulnerabilities we're going to display today was not in his original code. We had to either change the code base or disable things in Rails for us to actually do this. So that is the good news in all of this, that uh, Rails is actually doing a very good job of implementing security, but you need to be aware of what it's doing for you. So let's start with this. This is a simple finder, and we're uh, filtering some text over all the users. We want to find all the users with a name like whatever the filter text is. And we're just interpolating that text right there. And do you see the problem? Yes. Everyone should see the problem with this. If you're doing anything like this in your application, you are at security level zero. Um, your PHP program, I might give you a pass on that, but in Rails, <laughs> Zing, do not ever do this in SQL statements. Um, I'm going to turn this over to my hacker in residence, Matt, and he's going to actually show you what it looks like. Okay, so do a real quick demo. Um, as Jim referenced, uh, the example app here is this uh, movie night application. You, you make a uh, uh, movie, uh, not scheduled movie nights with friends. We had to kind of bring in sort of an interface here that lets expose um, you know, some of the exploits that we're, we're showing. And one here, we, so we created this uh, listing of users, um, which you can uh, kind of see, and adding in this filter that uh, we're referencing here. So we can filter by name. So if I say I want to filter by, say, Jerry, and I filter, and there we go. Now we only see Jerry, which is, you know, eminently useful. But uh, what if we uh, change this up a bit, and, and if we decide that uh, we're going to change the, what we pass in as our filter here. Notice he's hacking the URL directly. Going directly into the URL. So we'll just uh, a little bit of extra, what looks like could be possibly some SQL in here. <coughs> Sarah one equals one. Oh, look at that. And actually our list is a little longer. And now you can see the administrator on our site is the last bit of this We actually got serious finish back into this and hey, Did you see how simple that was? That was just uh, maybe six, seven characters that he had to type in. 
to do SQL injection. And you could have done that directly in the filter box too, couldn't you? Could have typed that straight in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which, yeah, that's interesting. We could actually do something uh, a little more complex uh, with this here. And let's just give our uh, filter a little more, a little more uh, guts to it and try everything else. And, oh. You have two question marks in that. Thank you. There we go. Oh, look at that. Now we see the uh, administrator's encrypted password. We have got the encrypted password from the database. Ouch. And, and you think, oh, it's an encrypted password. We're safe. Uh, you can crack that. If the, if the password is not a very good password, that is actually quite easy for hackers to crack. Actually, I, I don't know what Matt set up for his demo, but when I was doing this, all my passwords were pass, the, the P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D, so that would have been really easy to hack anyways. Okay, so what has happened? Uh, we intended for a string like this to be interpolated by clever use of uh, input from the command line, the commenting out of the remaining SQL and putting in a condition that's always true. We were able to dump the entire user uh, database. We were able to use union commands within SQL to pull in fields that were not normally pulled in and get that data out as well. So if you can do SQL injection, essentially your database is open for any piece of information to be pulled out of it. Okay. This is the solution. Use the question marks and the built-in um, SQL-based interpolation here, where you pass it as a separate uh, piece that is filled in. The database driver knows about question marks, and it will fill that in without danger of SQL injection. It will quote the comments. It will quote it the quotes correctly, and you don't have to worry about that. So please, please, please do this. This is the most basic level of security. This is a big problem in Rails, and this is one that I was aware of, but not really worried about. It turns out the way I write code, I would probably fall uh, to this vulnerability. And now that I'm aware of it, I can code around it. I, I'm aware of that. But you do this a lot in Rails. User update attributes, and you just pass up all the parameters in the form that come in like that. We do this a lot. Matt, would you demonstrate? Absolutely. Uh, so we uh, I can click here and go into edit my profile and see I can update a couple of fields here. I could change my name, which I probably won't, or I could change my email address, which actually that stayed the same. But uh, what I could do is bring in um, one of our favorite tools, a DOM inspector, and go into a little bit of uh, direct DOM manipulation and possibly get around uh, the uh, intended security or the intended uh, use of the app. Of this form. So I'll go up in and find one of the fields. I'll go and find the email address field for the user. And by editing this, let's say instead of email, if you recognize the, the standard Rails uh, uh, parameter name, uh, and we'll just say that true. How about that? So admin is the flag in the database that tells whether you're an administrator or not. And now I've up there. All right. And, and he's gone from the regular users list. Let's view the ad. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Mark and I hang out. We're on site all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Parameter hacking is trivial to do with debugging tools that are in Firefox and Safari and in Chrome. So what you need to do is, if there are parameters in your class that need to be protected from general update, uh, you need to do one of two things. Either this, you can use adder accessible and declare all the fields that a form is allowed to change. Or you use adder protective and declare all the fields that the form should not change. So, two ways of going. Accessible or protective. Which should we do? Accessible. Why? Why accessible? Whitelist or better? Because you might change the, you might change them, and, and, and this will, if you actually, if you actually have to specify them, you actually make sure they're on the list, they might change. White lists are better if you forget something, uh, you're still protected. Now, a lot of people like to use protected because 
oh, I, I've added a field and now my form won't change and ah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm annoyed for a few minutes while I figure out why it's wrong. Well, you can either be annoyed for a few minutes or you can suffer a major um, security problem. Um, I would go for protecting myself against security problems and, and deal with the annoyance. Yes, question down um, here. The, the danger with doing adder accessible, and, and that is what we do, but the danger with it is that if you forget to add it to any model, it defaults to everything accessible. So if you're going to do adder accessible, it's highly recommended to put something in config initializers that sets in just active record base adder accessible and nil. That's true. A another issue is how do you decide which fields need to be accessible and which fields need to be protected? And that's a choice you have to make. Um, essentially, if the data is not owned by the person editing the field, for example, in user form, I own my name, I own my password, I can specify that to be anything I want. It doesn't change, doesn't hurt the program for me to change it to anything that's, that can be validated. Um, the admin flag is not something that the user owns. So that's not something the user should be able to change willy-nilly in a regular form. So anything dealing with permissions, anything dealing with roles, anything dealing with security, should be protected. Anything that is not determined by the person editing the form should probably be detected. And that's kind of a rule of thumb that you can use to determine that. Okay, again, whitelist versus blacklist. We're going to come across this time and time again. And always prefer to whitelist the things that are permitted rather than blacklisting the things that are not permitted because there are a lot of things that can't, that uh, you can't think of everything that should not happen. Because a, a hacker will think of something that you didn't think of. Whitelist only the things that are good. Okay, cross-site scripting. Uh, this is another common one. And this deals with data in the database. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and demo our cross-site. Okay, I can do. Let's say I want to go ahead and create a new movie night here and invite all my friends. And I pick a place. <laughs> Movies related to turtles. <coughs> uh, that was a classic. All right. Okay. So um, I, could, I could write uh, in the notes field. I might do something like you know, you know popcorn provided. You know, yeah, yeah. That might, that might make sense to tell someone. Uh, make 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 popcorn bold. Make popcorn bold. That yeah, that's true. Because like, everybody loves popcorn. <laughs> and it makes sense. Uh, is, so to is, people, is it just be? Or, yeah, oh, it yes, it's more strong, I suppose, if you're wrong, being semantic. Um, I could do that. Uh, and it, it, would, it would be a uh, show as this nice bold field. That's in. Except for the style, if that's actually turned out. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> we'll pick something else. Um, but we, we really want to make sure people know that uh, the popcorn will be provided. We could uh, get all up in their face about it. Uh, yeah, I can change that. But I'm like, oh.
I, I yeah, it's just the cookie. It's a singular cookie. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Bear with me. Well, I, hacking is hard. Work. Hacking is hard, I tell you, you know? Maybe <laughs> 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 we'll just write the app, so. Especially with an yeah, So there we go. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Now, see what we've done? We have dumped the entire cookie database for this site in this browser. And, and we had to work really hard to do this, actually. Notice that we have movie night session with this long session ID. That is the critical piece. Um, by default, now, normally you can't do this in a Rails program. We had to actually go into Rails and tell it, hey, it's OK to let JavaScript get your session ID. Rails by, by default will prevent that. So again, this is a place where we had to work around Rails default handling to get that. But if you can get the session ID, you have control of the user. That identifies the user. You can copy that session ID to a different browser and uh, take over that account. Uh, yeah, still, that, uh, we're really just writing that cookie out to the, uh, you know, to the user's screen. And that might confuse or perplex them, but it's probably not going to get them hacked. Uh, but we could take it one step further and instead of just writing out the cookie value, write into the DOM an image tag. Um, and in that image tag, we point to some server of our, that we control writing in uh, the cookie value um, just as part of that uh, string. So we load it up. We get a bad image showing up right there. Okay, yeah. So the image didn't show up, but the request for that image went out to the hacker's web server. And let's look at the web server's log right now. Oh, look. The log in the hacker's web service now has our session token inside of it. Ouch. That is how easy it is to grab session IDs and cookies if you have cross-site scripting enabled. Okay, so the key is, there are a couple things that enable this. I mentioned one thing earlier, that we had to go and tell Rails it was okay for session cookies to be grabbed by JavaScript. By default, Rails says JavaScript cannot get to session cookies, and that's a good thing. Do not disable that like we did. That's one layer of protection. The other layer of protection, what really killed us though, is that we were outputting raw data from the database without filtering it, without doing anything. Now there are times you might want to do this if you want to um, allow markups such as bold or block quotes or image tags or anything like that. You want some HTML to filter through. You might want to use raw. You might want to use textile or markdown uh, to go out like that. Or if you're working on an old Rails system, you might just forget to put the H command on that. You know, the, the, the HTML escape command. That's easy to forget. Rails 3 defaults to putting that escape in, which is a good thing. Um, so, solution, don't use raw. If you need to use some HTML markup, use a whitelist of, of HTML that is allowed. Do not use a blacklist, and don't try to correct bad input, right? So here, we're saying, oh, we'll just remove script commands. Well, if the user input is something like this, and you remove the script, you end up with something like this. Don't try to correct it. Reject it. And look out for JavaScript that might appear in attributes that you wouldn't normally expect. Sanitize is a good method in Rails. Uh, this is actually pretty robust. The um, OWASP, the OWASP document, actually gives praise to sanitize. It says it's fairly robust. You give it a white list of tags that you allow. These are things that you might allow. These are pretty safe. Uh, you say, okay, only allow href and title attributes, and you probably, I don't know if Sanitize checks those for JavaScript or not. Hopefully it does. It's probably worth checking in. Um, but Sanitize, use Sanitize if you don't, uh, if you ever use raw output. Sanitize. Um, Cross-site scripting incidents. They are real. Uh, in 2006, 34,000 usernames and passwords were stolen from MySpace. The cross-site scripting script that they used essentially used JavaScript to hide the entire contents of the page and then to insert a login form that was fake and sent the username and password to the hacker's website. 
he grabbed 34,000 names and passwords before they stopped that. You want to mention talk about this one? Oh, sure. I, I would probably remember um, much more recently, just last, last September, Twitter was uh, hit with uh, the Rainbow Tweets worm, which was uh, a amusing, somewhat amusing self replicating worm that uh, basically an on, had an on mouse over event that uh, effectively was evaluating some, uh, some arbitrary script uh, that could be entered via the tweet form, uh, which wound up uh, sending a lot of people to some adult oriented sites, uh, which is always good. <laughs> and that was very recent. So, so it's still out there. I mean, even sites like Twitter fall prey to this. So check, check, check your output. If you're using raw, sanitize it. Okay. This is a fun one. Privilege escalation. Uh, suppose I have some code that looks like this. Uh, I want to display a particular movie night. So I just I grab the uh, ID off of the list. And I look it up, and I display it in the form. Let's, uh, let's demo this vulnerability. So we go back to our uh, friendly interface here. You can see that uh, you know, I'm logged in as me, logged in as Matt, and yet I just, for convenience, I have uh, accessible to me, you can see a couple of links to uh, some of Jim's movie nights, which, um, he didn't see fit to invite me to, uh, <laughs> but because we're not, he wouldn't be interested in the movies. They're, they're well, you know, actually, I mean, a, you know, I, I love Star Wars, Jim. That hurts me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, despite the fact that I'm not, oh, it's, it's, it's the, the, the number four too. Yeah, I, I now feel bad. Yes, well, I, I would have been offended further had it been the prequels, but um, so. Even though I'm not actually uh, invited to this movie, I, I can view it, and in fact, I could go ahead and, and, and vote, but since I don't want you to watch Star Wars, you're gonna have to watch the Ninja Oh, ouch. So. <laughs> actually, what happened there is a very simple hack, and, and even if we didn't put up that list of URLs there for him to easily click on, he could have gone up to the URL bar and uh, hacked in any, um, ID for some night in there. I happen to know you'll be watching later on on February 9th. See? So even if I don't tell him what movies I'm watching, he can hack the URL and get to it. This is a um, uh, called privilege escalation. He's getting to data that he's not privileged to see. And even though we supposedly would only give him URLs for his own, he can hack in any URL he wants. Let's go ahead and pull up the, the thing. Okay, so instead of doing this, what I really should have done, instead of doing a night find, I should have started with the current user and asked for all the nights and then done a find based upon the nights of the current user. If I had done this and he had entered in a night that did not belong to the logged in user, he would have gotten a validation error and it would have failed for him. So this is one that I tend not to use finders on associations, mainly because I like to think of associations as just arrays and the fact that also active record stuff kind of messes with my mind. So um, I tend not to do this and I think we're going to change that behavior because of this very fact. All right. Uh, yeah, we're right at 30 minutes. Let's finish. Uh, we're, I think we're doing good here. Uh, Cross-site request forgery. This is, this is a big one. How many people have ever seen the authenticity token in your Rails form? How many people know what that does for you? Uh, oh, let's ask this. How many people don't know what it does? Yeah, exactly. This is a really, really interesting one. Imagine that you're in your browser and you point your browser to the hacker web page. Of course, it's not called the hacker web page. He has some innocuous name like a um, bunnies and rainbow uh, web page. It's and very you <laughs> very exciting, yes. And you pull down a page, and within that page is embedded an image tag that, whose source is the movienight.com and lists uh, a destroy URL for one of the movie nights. So that gets loaded in the browser. The browser then asks for the image by going out to movie night uh, website and destroying one of the movie nights. And notice because your browser is still logged into movie night website, it still has the session. 
Now, the hacker website doesn't have your session ID. He has no idea what your session ID is, so he cannot delete it directly. But by giving you an image tag, he asks you indirectly to delete that, to modify data uh, on your, for yourself without you knowing it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and demo this one. Okay, so we've done, constructed a, uh, another page here which uh, is meant to entice, entice you, but uh, there is the, uh, the key aspect is there's an embedded form which is pointing across the movie night site. Um, and so this is, this is on the hacker website. This is on the hacker website. And, but the hacker being enterprising knows a little bit about how uh, Rails apps works and has embedded a hidden delete uh, property there. So if I go over to this, uh, this awesome page that would <laughs> like me to win, awesome. I would like to win, and I click the big red button, oh, night ID. I swear he did this right before the, the, the talk. Just, just edit it in the plain the There it is. There it is. Okay, oh, there we go. Okay. So hmm, I hope you meant to delete that. Cross site <coughs> reference forgery, it, it's different than cross site scripting where you load scripts in. It's using image tags directed to sites not uh, necessarily belonging to you to actually do, do harm to the data. <coughs> Okay, so countermeasures. Number one, write your websites to be restful. Uh, if you do so, then things like image tags will not work because the browser can use a get to do that. You shouldn't use get to modify your data. That's level one security. However, a hacker could very easily do this. In fact, that's exactly what Matt did in the demo. He set up a form that uh, issued the proper thing. And so um, if you look at a Rails, form that's generated with the helpers, you will see a field called authenticity token, and it's this really long kind of random looking value. And that is generated based upon uh, crypto security stuff within Rails. It's unique to this session, and the hacker will not be able to get it. Remember, the hacker's on a separate website. He has no idea what your authenticity token is, so he cannot include it in any form that he will generate. So when he issues this, it'll fail because the authenticity token is not either not found or not the correct one. So that prevents that. That is why you have authenticity tokens in your Rails web forms now. How many people, okay, seeing all this work with using, using image tags, I have to ask you, how many people use a mail browser or uh, uh, a mail client that automatically displays images for any email coming in. Anybody do that? Do you want to think about that for a little bit? <laughs> okay, uh, cross-site scripting. Since cross-site scripting runs a script in your browser, you can actually access that authenticity token. So cross-site scripting can still defeat this issue, but uh, that's a little bit different. So. Uh, you still need to guard against that. Uh, this is really interesting. In Mexico, there tends to be a particular brand of router that is commonly used. Someone set up a CSRF attack that sent out a GET request that went to the router, reconfigured the router, so the DNS entries for a particular bank in Mexico was redirected to a hacker site where he had a fake website set up. They collected a whole bunch of bank accounts by using this cross-site <coughs> reference forgery technique. Uh, Gmail AdSense, uh, someone once changed some um, administrator's emails using this technique. 
Okay. You want to talk about session spoofing? Yeah, let's talk about it really quickly. I think we all probably recognize um, this. Yeah. Um, Fire Sheep was uh, it's very notorious. Is, uh, is, is anybody running Fire Sheep in here right now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the notorious uh, sessions moving right, someone wrote a uh, utility that basically um, an open uh, wireless network would do packet sniffing and would uh, uh, look for um, recognizable session tokens being passed over the wire, looking for uh, common social media sites, and you then could uh, spoof someone's authenticated session by uh, uh, basically piggybacking and copying their, their live session. Uh, we, we could do a demo of this right now, we could show, but no, we're not, we're not actually going to. Um, uh, basically, around this, you want to require SSL. Um, you know, I think it's becoming more and more advocated for and accepted that you basically are just going to protect any portion of your site that is uh, authenticated in session days um, by requiring SSL. And then, and then uh, specifying to use secure cookies, uh, just like HTTP only is. Um, uh, an option you can specify on cookies, you can as well specify that they be secure, which means that they're only going to be passed back and forth if uh, over HTTPS. Um, there's Rack SSL. This is, this is kind of a drop-in solution, but it is across the board. Um, it will force all of your requests and all uh, you know, everything, assets and whatnot, uh, to use HTTPS, and it will automatically mark um, all cookies as secure, including. <laughs> okay, that's a good timing. We actually got about. Uh, three three minutes left here. So let's just do a quick summary of, of things that you need to be aware of. Number one, trust nothing. This is the primary goal when you're doing security auditing. Uh, I'm a very trusting fellow. I do not think about people uh, hacking on URLs or putting strange things in image source tags or anything. That, that, that just doesn't occur to me. My mind doesn't work like that. But if you want to think about security, you've got to get to the point where you don't trust anything that comes in from outside your program. Stay up to date on all the plugins and frameworks that you use. They often put out security updates. And if you get behind, uh, we've done some security audits on software that we have delivered. And one of the things they ding us on is we're not using the latest security patches in the plugins and frameworks that we're using. So keep up to date on that. Uh, don't bypass the Rails built-in security measures. 90% of the stuff we did here, we were able to do because I went in and disabled the HTTP only thing. We uh, took off the protected attribute features. We turned off uh, authenticity tokens. Because of that, we were able to get by that. Don't do that. There's a reason that all that stuff is there. Um, always scope your find by the proper privileges. This is a habit I need to develop. Um, avoid using raw, and if you do use raw, you sanitize uh, with whitelists. I would recommend you have an outside firm who specializes in security monitor your program. You, as a developer, don't think about security the same way these guys who do security audits do. And it is well worth your money, especially if you have a large public-facing site that you do a security audit for. We've done it on several of our programs that we've delivered, and it was very, very useful. And finally, just be aware. Don't blindly do things because everybody else has done it. Think about what you're doing and be aware of the security implications of everything that you're doing in your website. It was a little discouraging reading all the things that hackers can do, but it was very encouraging to see that our software, for the most part, is, uh, is protecting us. We just need to be aware of it and work with it. All right, any questions in the minute or so we have left? Yes, back there. Uh, not a question, but just a statement. First of all, guys, thank you very, very much for this really important topic. But I just want to make aware, uh, there's an amazing resource called Metasploit. If you've never heard of this, uh, it basically lets you do penetration testing on your own systems using a very nice Rails-based interface. It's all written in Ruby. You should go check it out. It's an amazing tool. Aaron, Aaron Bedrose worked with that, is that the right? That's right. Yeah, Aaron is the one who actually did our security audit, so yeah, good recommendation. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, over here. One other quick thing to inject, and maybe we can talk about this afterward, but uh, our team has recently learned in working with an external security audit company that many people now consider Rails's, even Rails 3's default CSRF protection to be insufficient really? and, and insecure. 
and maybe we can talk afterwards I'd, about I'd it. I'd love to hear about that, yeah, because I just now learned about what it does. So The basic reason is that you only generate one authenticity token per user session. And so, and you keep reusing that for every form, every submission. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're logged into the site for an hour, that's an hour in which an attacker can sniff it with Fire Sheep or packet sniffing or something else, generate a big red uh -huh. button with your authenticity token, and trick so you into going. You want to generate page. a new one every every form. So, right. But then there are there are difficulties and challenges with that. But maybe we can talk no, about how. So, so yeah, that's a good point. Good point. But it's a, and it's also one more reason not that it's a catch-all, but advocate for SSL for all. Read, read the documents that we put up there. There's a lot of suggestions on how to manage sessions that we did not even talk about, about resetting sessions often, changing the session IDs to keep that from giving time for hackers to find that. Lots and lots and lots of good advice in there. Uh, one more question. Yes? So uh, when you try to protect against something like Firesheet, does that uh, implicitly entail you upgrading your hardware since there might be a significant uh, increase in Degradation of performance and everything Protecting against the question is protecting against fire sheet. Does that mean increasing your hardware because there's a degradation in performance because you're using HSM? Yes. Right? <laughs> you know what? I don't know. I don't know how big that performance degradation well, is. I know there's uh, one really, thing. That, that's kind of a thing that's kind of Right. There's, there's, going be, there's going to be a white paper, actually, yeah. um, that, you read that, that they did a study and um, related to Gmail implementing and going inside with SSI. Um, and basically, their conclusion was it's not costing us too much, so it's not going to cost you. It, it certainly so outweighs the downside. Yeah, it's a certain yeah. habit. I, you know, truthfully, I, trend, I tend not to use public conference Wi-Fi if I can avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, we had we were at a, um, a conference in January, and I'm going to share this. We had someone hack into uh, some edge case laptops with, that were there at the conference, and they came forward. They said, "Hey, we we were found your laptops were kind of open, and we." Browsed a little bit, we found some data that really shouldn't have been available there, and we were <laughs> we were embarrassed, and we sent around some memos and made sure that people tend to close down ports on their laptops when they're in conferences. And personally, if I can avoid getting on a public Wi-Fi, a Panera Wi-Fi, or a conference Wi-Fi, I I try to tend to avoid it these days. With Fire Sheep, I, I don't know if everyone's ever looked at that. That's dirt easy to install into Firefox, and it just this. You know, if you're on a public Wi-Fi, it just grabs all kinds of things. There, there's a plugin called HTTPS Everywhere for, for Firefox that, that plugs a lot of those holes. And I, whenever I'm on a public Wi-Fi, I always use that. Yeah. Or you are, use a VPN when you're on a public Wi-Fi. If you can set up a VPN, that's an excellent thing to do. And just use that exclusively whenever you're on a public Wi-Fi. There are things that we, you know, we really need to be aware of as, as developers. We need to be on the cutting edge of this, not be caught flat-footed. And just to say real quick, and then force TLS is another one, but the, the problem again, like those things, there's always a moment that's going to fall down, right? And you know it's like forgetting log in with your other browser or something like that. Like I, I really, personally, I'm, I'm much more advocating for sites to start implementing just, just force SSL and take the, you know, but. Uh, okay, well thank you very much.